sometimes, and you'll, you'll see this as you uh, move through uh, the Old Testament, particularly the Old Testament, sometimes when God chooses a prophet to speak to his people, he actually picks someone who you wouldn't expect him to pick. He, he picks someone with no history at all, no uh, present, no past, they just appear, someone that no one knows. And so you'll read of a, a prophet like Ahijar in, in 1 Kings chapter 11 or, or Shemaiah in 1 Kings chapter 12 or, or Hanani in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 16. And they're just three. There are many other uh, prophets, rather obscure prophets, uh, prophets that you've never heard of before and yet God just picks them up and he uses them as a mouthpiece. Sometimes, however, he chooses someone who has a little bit of a pedigree. He chooses someone who, when they speak, uh, people stop and without hesitation they listen to what it is that they have to say. Uh, not necessarily because of what they have to say, but because of their pedigree, because of who they are. Now, I don't know if anyone here has watched that uh, recent movie uh, called Six Minutes to Midnight. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not Batman. Uh, if anyone was here this morning, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you weren't here this morning, if you didn't catch it online, please make sure that you watch our YouTube uh, channel and tune in because uh, it's a great uh, theological study, I, I think you could say, of Batman. I'm not talking about Batman, unfortunately. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm talking about Six Minutes to Midnight. And Six Minutes to Midnight, it's a, it's a movie that tells the true story of a group of, of young German girls who were studying in England just before the outbreak of World War II. Anyone seen it? Great movie. Go and watch it. And what was so important about these particular young ladies was that they were, were daughters of men who belonged to the German high command. See, these young ladies, they weren't just any students. They were daughters of the very men who would be responsible for leading the might of the German war machine against England and her allies at the outbreak of World War II. And so rather than allow these young ladies to leave, England held on to them. And it must have sent shockwaves through the entire German high command. The blood of those who would determine the future of Germany was running through the veins of these young women. Germany knew it, and England, they also knew it. Zephaniah, for those of us who are unfamiliar, he, he was the great, great grandson, we are told in the, in the book's introduction, of King Hezekiah. And 2 Kings chapter 18 says this of Hezekiah. No king of Judah among either his predecessors or his successors could be compared to him. That's some statement, isn't it? Imagine if someone said that about you. And so Zephaniah is not so, some obscure nobody. On the contrary, he has royal blood running through his veins. And not just any royal blood, but, but the, the blood of a king who did what was right. And Israel had a lot of kings, didn't they, who didn't do what was right. But this man, Hezekiah, he was a king who honoured God. He was a king who served God's people. And so when Zephaniah opened his mouth, Israel listened. And God, through his faithful servant, Zephaniah, the, the great, great grandson of, of King Hezekiah, he is about to call them to account. And so what exactly is the problem? Why is it that God is calling them to account? Well, the great problem, and we've seen this over a, a number of weeks already as we moved through the book of Ezekiel, the problem is that they look just like the nations around them. <laughs> That's the problem. When you can't distinguish between those who call themselves God's people and those who are not God's people, that's a problem. 
To be God's people in name only, church, does more damage to God's reputation than a world filled with people who make no such claim. It does tremendous damage. And so how is it that God's people in the days of Zephaniah behaved? In what sense were they, in what sense were they God's people in name only? Well, for a start, and it's only just a start, and we're not going to go on and look at all of the problems that God's people got themselves into. But for a start, they bowed down to idols. They, they worship, that's true. They are a worshipping nation. The great problem is that their worship is futile. They say that God is their God, but they live lives as though he wasn't their God, as though he isn't their God. And so God commissions his servant Zephaniah to speak. And so here we have a man of faith living amongst a people who are God's people outwardly, but who inwardly they are a people who are far from him. And so that's the man. What about the book? Well, the book of Zephaniah belongs to a, to a group of books that we refer to as the minor prophets. And we call them minor, not because they're insignificant or not very important, but because unlike the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel, the minor prophets, they are very short. The book of Zephaniah is only three chapters long. So if you want to go home tonight and read a good book, Say to your parents, you know what, I'm going to read this book and I'm not going to go to close my eyes until it's finished. Read Zephaniah. Three chapters long. He speaks and just as quickly he falls silent. And you know what? We never hear from him again. Not a, not a skerrick. Now the truth is that sometimes you don't need to say a great deal, do you, in order to be heard. Sometimes everything that needs to be said can be said in three short chapters. It's a little bit like Christians today, isn't it? Everything that Christians need to say can be summed up, church, in three short words. Jesus is Lord. That's the gospel. Jesus is Lord. Everything the world needs to hear and everything the world needs to know is summed up, in fact, in those three short words. Jesus is Lord. Not maybe, <laughs> not possibly. Jesus is Lord. And yet even though what Zephaniah says is captured in just three short chapters, his message is both frightening as it is hopeful. And so what does he say? Well, Zephaniah begins in chapter 1 with a word of judgment and he ends in chapter 3 with a word of restoration. And the passage we're looking at, church, that's all about restoration. In chapters 1 and 2, Zephaniah has pronounced judgment. Zephaniah has pronounced judgment on both the nations and upon God's own people, those who call themselves God's people, upon Judah. What is coming, says Zephaniah, is the day of the Lord. And did you know, church, that, that the day of the Lord is mentioned more in the book of Zephaniah, in these three short chapters, than any other Old Testament book? It begins like this. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, says Zephaniah in chapter 1 and verse 7, for the day of the Lord is near. And so what exactly is the day of the Lord? Well, the day of the Lord, church, is the day of God's wrath. The day of the Lord is the day of God's judgment. The day when God finally says enough. You heard your parents say that? Enough is enough. You know when your parents say the word enough, that they mean enough. No more. No more rebellion. No more lying. No more cheating and stealing. No more pretending that you're not answerable to anyone but yourself. Enough. The day of the Lord is when it all comes to an end. 
The day of the Lord is when God says enough. And the reason the day of the Lord isn't every day, church, is because he's patient. God takes no joy, we are told in Scripture, in punishing those who deserve his, his punishment. It's not something that God delights in. And, and yet as patient as he is, God's, God's holiness, God's, God's purity and, and God's justice, something we don't hear about often, God's justice demands that he act. And so the day of the Lord, says Zephaniah, it's, it's, it's near. God's patience is up. And God is going to act. And for Zephaniah and for, and for Judah, the day of the Lord would come in the form of Babylon. But, but it also points to something much, much bigger than, than Babylon. The Bible looks forward to the day of the Lord. The final day, in fact, when, when everything will be wrapped up. It's the day when, when all of the nations will be brought low. Babylon, Rome... And even Judah, those who call themselves God's own people, who, who haven't truly repented, they will be held accountable for their sin. And so if we're, we're going to understand the passage in front of us, we, we have to understand what comes before. If we're going to understand chapter 3, we have to understand chapters 1 and 2. What we're looking at in, in chapter 3 is... Good news. That's true, isn't it? R restoration is good news. God is going to make right all that is wrong, and, and He achieves the church by calling the nations to account. You see, the God of grace, He's also the God of justice. It's the same coin, it's just two sides. And so God will one day, yet again, call the nations to account. He'll, he'll call China to account. He'll call Australia to account. He'll call Afghanistan and Iran and the US to account. North Korea and Russia, New Zealand and India, France and Saudi Arabia. And he'll even call those who are his own people and yet aren't really his people. He'll call them to account too. The God of the Bible, church, is the God of justice. But he's also the God of grace. We know that, don't we? The God of justice is the God of grace. And so God judges the guilty, chapters 1 and 2, and, and then he, he restores the fortunes of his people, those who really are his people. And so what we have, church, in, in the book of Zephaniah is both judgment and restoration. Judgment and restoration. And so the day of the Lord is both bad news as well as good news. It's judgment for the wicked, for those who don't receive God's grace, followed by restoration for those upon whom God's favour rests. And with that introduction in mind, how about we pray? Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do thank you that uh, you sent a prophet like Zephaniah, a man with pedigree but who didn't rest upon his pedigree, a man who loved you with all his heart and because he loved you, you used him as your mouthpiece to bring a word of judgment but also a word of grace, a word of restoration. And Lord, my prayer is tonight we might have hearts that would hear you speak, that you might put me to one side and that your servants in this place would hear you speak. Speak to us now through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Advent, uh, that's the season that we're in at the moment. Advent, you'll remember, is all about God's coming. And as he's his coming draws near, God's people are called to do something. God's people are called to wait. Well, that's a, not a bad word. Let's use that too. God's people are called to wait. Now, some wait for his coming because they're, they're living in a land of exile. They're living in a land of exile and they long to return. 
They want to be where God himself is. They, they want, in other words, to go home, don't they? And of course, every Christian who dies does exactly that. They go home. Others wait for his coming because their, their lives are, are filled with suffering and pain. That's true too, isn't it? It's true of some Christians. Their lives are filled with suffering and, and pain. And, and they long for, they wait for the renewal of all things. The time when all of their suffering and all of their pain will be over. Still others wait for his coming because life is filled with contradictions. Life is filled with uncertainty. They're tired and they've grown weary. And they long for the day when sin is replaced by the sure and certain promises of the God who loves them. And in the passage before us, God's people are called to wait for their restoration. We see that in verse 20, don't we? At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes. And so having been sent into exile, God's people, says God through his, his prophet Zephaniah, they will have their fortunes restored. All of the joy and hope for the future that will be stolen by the Babylons when they ransack the city and destroy the temple. All of it, says God, is going to be restored. And all of their freedom and and blessing, that also is going to be restored. And as I read that, I wonder, what is it that you are waiting for? to be restored your health maybe is that what you're waiting for to be restored your youth perhaps over this side there's not too many people that are waiting for that to be restored but perhaps there's a few of us in here who are waiting for our youth to be restored your sense of justice feelings of love and belonging a home family Something that someone stole from you, perhaps. You see, whatever it is that has been stolen from you, either through the the ravages of sin or time or, or injury or even injustice, whatever it is, God will restore. That's what his word promises to us. That, that church is what we wait for. That's what Christians wait for. And we don't wait as those who have no certainty wait. We wait, those of us who belong to Christ, we wait with a certain and an unquenchable hope. Why? Well, because God has promised to restore it. You see, this is not, this is not merely the words of a man that we're reading here in, in verse 20. No, no, this is God's word. And so we wait. And we wait, church, with a hope that can't be shaken. The world can take a lot of things from us, but what it can never take from us is hope. It can't do it. Why not? Because God gives us that hope. And so what else do people who wait for restoration do? You see, waiting doesn't mean that God's people do nothing. What do men and women who who wait for God's promise of of restoration, what is it that they do as they wait? Well, one thing they do is sing. (laughs) We see that in verse 14. There Zephaniah tells God's people to, to sing and to shout and to be glad and to rejoice with all of their heart. That's what that's what he tells us. You see, the thought that God is coming to redeem his people and to make right all that is broken is to to fill their minds and their hearts so that it overflows in in scenes of enthusiastic celebration. You you can't read that and not see that. It's there. God's people are encouraged to do what? Well, they're encouraged, church, to shout aloud. There is something altogether rapturous that that cannot be contained in quiet, dignified, polite thanksgiving. I don't think God calls us to be polite. 
I don't think God calls us to be quiet. Knowing that the God who hates sin is coming, not to crush his people, but but to restore all that his people have lost and, and to be their God is not something that God's people can be quiet about. God, in fact, doesn't want them to be quiet. He he wants them to sing and to shout his praise. That's what God wants. That's what God deserves. I do wonder sometimes, particularly as I read passages such as this one, if, if our celebration of the God who is... The God who has done for us what he has done isn't quite what it should be. Perhaps our focus on doing things in an orderly manner and our fear of upsetting the person next to us or the person who's sitting behind us is robbing God of the kind of enthusiastic celebration that, well, quite frankly, he deserves. Does he not? It's just a thought. I do wonder sometimes. How is it, church, that that we can shout and scream when our team kicks the winning goal but remain so subdued and so polite knowing what it is that God has done for us? It somehow doesn't quite fit. And then in verse 15, Zephaniah gets to the heart of why it is that God's people should sing and shout and be glad and rejoice. Why? Well, because, says Zephaniah, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. And so in in verse 15, Zephaniah lays out four reasons why God's people should rejoice as they wait for God's promise of restoration. Firstly, God has taken away their punishment. God has taken away their punishment. God's people, in other words, will not be exiled forever. God is going to bring them home. Secondly, God has turned back their enemy. Now, it may look as though God's people are finished. And as Zephaniah is speaking his words, I'm sure that's exactly how it looked to God's people as Ezekiel preached them, as as Jeremiah preached them. I'm, I'm sure that's exactly what it looked like. As the armies of King Nebuchadnezzar surrounded the city, all of their hope appeared lost. But what does God promise he promises to take away their punishment only for a time says God (laughs) only for a time are you going to suffer you will suffer but only for a time all of the hurt and all of the pain because of your sin and because of your folly one day it will be removed the enemy in other words isn't going to have the final word that's a wonderful promise Who's your enemy? Maybe outside, or maybe it's an enemy within. (laughs) But the enemy won't have the final word. And just when it looks hopeless, God is going to turn it all around. The enemy will themselves be defeated. And of course, we see that most victoriously, don't we, in the cross of Jesus. Just when the enemy seems to have the victory, God steps in and the enemy is turned away. And death itself is defeated. Thirdly, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with his people. And we see that, of course, in verse 15. And and again in verse 17, the Lord your God is with you. God's people may have turned their back on God, but but God will never abandon his people. He will punish his people. He will will give uh, give to his people that which their actions deserve, but, but God will never abandon them. He can't abandon them. He he, he can't abandon them because he enters into covenant with them. And one thing God will never do is break his covenant. He is the covenant-keeping God. That is who God is. 
He won't do it because he can't do it. God's promise is God's promise. It's, it's why Christians can, can lay their head on their pillow knowing that when they wake up, the God who loved them before they went to bed will love them when they open their eyes. Take that to bed with you tonight. The God who loved you before you lay down your head is the God who will love you when you first open your eyes. That's the God we serve. Why? Well, because he's faithful to his covenant promise. And, and therefore, church, he's, he's faithful to you and he's faithful to me. Now, get this, even when you are not. God is faithful to you even when you are not faithful to him. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. And fourthly, God's people rejoice because never again will you fear any harm. We see that also in verse 15. In, in other words, when God restores the fortunes of his people, says Zephaniah, fear of, fear of harm, fear of calamity and misfortune and suffering and defeat, all of it is going to be gone. Never again will you fear God's judgment. Why not? Because Restoration Church is not merely outward. It's inward. God is going to restore our heart. Faithless hearts are going to be turned into faithful hearts. It's a wonderful truth. Men and women who stray will be restored so that they no longer stray. Hearts that run after idols will bow down only to the living God. He will be their God and they will be his people. It's something that Stephen brought to us a number of weeks ago. You see, that's what restoration looks like. That's exactly what restoration looks like. Not only the restoration of everything that is good and right, but the removal of all that is not good. The removal of all that is not right. No more fear. No more suffering. No more death. And so as we wait for Restoration Church, there really is reason to sing, isn't there? And to shout and to be glad and to rejoice with all our heart. Don't worry what the person next to you thinks. Don't be concerned if the person behind you looks down their nose at you. Don't worry. Who are you singing to? You're singing to the God who deserves our praise. The God who promises to restore his people. And then Zephaniah in verses 16 and 17, he, he, he paints a picture that is on the one hand very easy to imagine. It's really, it's really simple to imagine. But on the other hand, it's, it's, well, it's almost impossible to get your head around. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. Now that church, that's the easy part. I think none of us have too much trouble understanding what it is that, that God through his servant Zephaniah is, is here saying. It's, it's a picture that we can understand, isn't it, without too much difficulty. When God comes, says Zephaniah, after he has punished the guilty and, and addressed the wickedness and restored his people and taken up residence in their midst, in response, God's people are to do what? They are to raise their hands, not only in surrender, although it is in surrender, but also in praise and in celebration. Don't just stand there as if the God in your midst is nothing to get excited about. If you're going to get excited, get excited about him. And the picture, I think, is not unlike the child holding out his, his hands to his or her parents or, or grandparents as they approach the front door. And I'll never forget the picture in my own mind of my dad as he stood at the front door of, of his house and my son Reuben, when he was just a little fella, ran up to... I'll never forget this picture. I know why it's that, because it happened with all of the kids, but, but that one was stunning and it, and it was just seared in my brain as he's, he saw his granddad and his arms just went out like this and he ran as fast as he could, he could go. And Dad did the same in return. It's just a beautiful picture, seared in my mind. That's what Zephaniah is here talking about. 
Do we get excited like that? To lift one's hands in a show of affection and anticipation as we are swept off our feet and lifted into the breast of the one who loves us. That was the picture of my dad and my son all those years ago. I've never forgotten it. That's a picture that Zephaniah here paints for us of God's people and their God as they get excited because of who it is that stands in their midst. It's a wonderful picture. But not only that, when we we come to verse 17, even the direction of of blessing, the the direction of of rejoicing is is flipped on its head. You see, not only do we rejoice as we we come into the presence of our gracious and loving Saviour, as I said, that's something that we can understand, right? The amazing thing about this is that He rejoices over us. Listen to him. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Let that sink in. Listen to what it is that God is saying through his servant Zephaniah. God delights in us. God God rejoices over us with singing. So, So thrilled is he with those who sing his praises that he sings over us. Do you even imagine that? It's almost too much to expect. It's, it's almost too difficult to comprehend. You see, the, the gods of the ancient world just didn't do that. They just, that's not what they did. The, the gods of the ancient world, well, they were unapproachable. They, they demanded praise, but they never gave praise. They, they demanded that, that men and women bowed down to them, but they never rejoiced over those who so bowed. They were distant gods. They were aloof gods. They were cold gods. How different the God of Zephaniah. How how different the God of Christians. What does he do? As we lift up our hands, he takes us in his arms and he rejoices over us with singing. See, praise is never one way. And I think that's the mistake we make. (laughs) It's a two-way street. We sing over God, and God, he responds by singing over us. But notice something else. Notice that not only does God rejoice over those who rejoice over him, verse 17, God also gathers those who mourn, and he removes all of their burdens, and he removes all of their sorrow, verse 18. Now, verse 18 is somewhat of a difficult verse to translate into English. Uh, Read any number of commentaries and you'll see what I mean. Uh, I opened one up after another and and it was was difficult. It it was, they kind of said the same thing, but they all shifted. And although the NIV does a good job, I, I, I think in a great many cases of of capturing the original Hebrew and and, and Greek, I I think it misses the mark somewhat in this particular verse. The New American Standard Version translates Zephaniah 3.18 like this. Uh, And you'll see the NIV up the top there. Uh, The New American Standard Version says, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you to whom its reproach is a burden. God's people, those who are are filled with sorrow over all they have lost and have had to endure reproach, he gathers them. You see what it says? Again, it's a wonderful picture. He he redeems them, in other words. He, He brings them out of exile and he restores them to himself. And and everything that once served only to grieve them and to and to cause them heartache, everything will be gone. It'll be left behind. It'll be only a memory, but but nothing more than a memory. It'll have no power over them. We have memories like that, don't we? 
those things that when we woke up the next day, we were grieved to our heart and we thought it'd never let go of us? I've had that happen to me. And over a period of time, they become nothing but a memory. They're there, but they're, they're in the past. And that's what God promises for his people, that everything that, that has grieved you, everything that causes you discomfort and hurt and pain and, 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 and sorrow, things that make you mourn, God promises that they may be a memory, <laughs> but they're going to be back there. They're all going to be put in the past, left behind. Let me ask you, what is it that causes you sorrow? What causes your heart to ache? As you live in exile, as it were, and, and wait for Christ's return, what, what grief do you live with? Well, some of us perhaps aren't old enough to live with any real substantial grief. It's not true of all, but of most, perhaps. Those of us who have lived a little bit longer will know what that means. Whatever it is, Although you carry it, and perhaps you even carry it alone, even though you know that whilst you carry it, he carries you, when, when God gathers you to himself, when, when Christ returns to collect those who have waited for him and who trust in him, all of their grieving will then cease. Your mourning, church, will at that time come to an end. All of your pain and all of your doubt and all of your sorrow will fade. And it will be consigned only to history. That church is the hope of all who wait for him. Chapter 3 finishes with two summary statements. And each statement begins with the words, at that time, and ends with four promises of deliverance. At that time, I will, I will, I will, I will. At that time, I will, I will. I will, I will. Starting to get a, get a hint that God's serious about something here? All right. He's going to do it. When Christ returns, at that time I will deal with your enemies, I will rescue the lame, I will gather the exiles, I will honour them. When Christ returns, at that time, I will gather my own. I will bring you home. I will honour you among the nations. I will restore your fortunes. There will be times, church, when your husband will let you down. Yes, there will. <laughs> there will be times, church, when your wife will let you down. Yes, there will. There will be times when your church will let you down. There will be times when your pastor lets you down. Yes, there will. But church, hear me when I say this. God will never, ever let you down. And the time is coming when all of his promises will be fulfilled for all who trust in him. Restoration, church, is coming. That's why we wait. Because at that time, says God, I will, I will, I will, I will. At that time, I will, I will, I will, I will. At that time. And so we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do thank you for that promise, that promise of restoration. At that time, you will restore all things. We thank you for those promises because we know they're sure. We know they're certain. Why? Because you are a covenant-keeping God. Lord, help us to honour you in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we think, not to earn your favour, but because your favour rests on us. And so, Lord, as we uh, go our way tonight, even as we continue to worship you tonight, may we do so not only with our lips, but with our whole heart. And may you receive all the praise and all the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.